Stage prof, um, which is a great tool for breaking down um, function timings um, in uh, Drupal page load. It's brilliant because it tells you how long um, HP spends in a specific function, so you can see whether that function is taking 100, 200 milliseconds to run. Um, usually when you run it on Drupal, you'll see that um, when you've got caching turned off, um, you'll see quite a lot of book menu calls, um, which can slow you side down. Depends why. Good. Bad server, again, <coughs> stop. A lot of people that um, we see um, come to us and say, well, my site's really slow, and then we ask them where you're hosting. So normally then we hear the good answers of fast hosts and other such host hosting providers. So then the kind of question is, so how's 5.99 a month working out for you? Um, again, caching will help, but still got bigger issues here. The good thing about servers is you can scale horizontally and vertically pretty quickly these days with cloud technology. So it is a fixable problem, but again, you should still address the bigger issues. Then there's the third type, which it's not, in which case, I like people like um, People that actively have good code bases and want to put caching in because they like having sites with so 400 millisecond load times. Um, caching is always a good thing, except when you have to debug it, which is then it becomes difficult, which I'll come on to. So, caching in Drupal, um, there are plenty of different ways to cache things. Um, Drupal provides its own caching API. Um, this can be simply dropping down into the functions cache get and cache set. Um, these are meant to handle it. If you're a Drupal module developer, and you have any data that is um, required on repeatedly, I highly suggest you use these. Um, there's APC, which um, is just an app get install on Ubuntu. Um, I'm not going to cover that today. Um, resource caching, this kind of comes back to front end um, sort of resources, stuff like uh, HTML, CSS, um, JavaScript, things like that. Um, database layer caching, um, which is also very handy. Um, content distribution networks, um, kind of related to resource caching, but for bigger files such as video and audio, stuff that you probably wouldn't want being served off your own web server. So, code level. Drupal has its own caching API. Module developers, you should use it. If you're not, then I suggest you look into it. Um, cache set. Uh, this stores data, um, data in Drupal's cache table. If anybody's looked at um, a Drupal database, you'll see lots of tables with cache and scores prepended to them. Um, this is Drupal's cache yeah. API. Uh, cache get is a way of getting that cache out. Um, the nice thing about this is you can actually um, define your own caching tables, um, so you don't have to stick with Drupal's normal cache um, <coughs> tables. Uh, for example, views, views does it, so uh, there's cache and score views, um, which is defined by the views module. Um, resource caching, there are many different types of resources on the site. Um, each can be cached by various different tools. Um, when, you in, when you're looking at resource caching, it's kind of best to take a shotgun approach to it and just everything. Um, for example, <coughs> Drupal actually has its own CSS and JS caching in the um, form of aggregated CSS and JS. It does minify things and it does cut page load times down as well as helping IE browsers. Um, Drupal's page cache um, is basically what you see in kind of many of the core cache tables. Um, there's third party modules such as Boost, um, which is a Drupal module that you can install. And there's tools like Varnish, um, which are server level um, caching tools. <coughs> so this is just an example of um, Drupal's default CSS and JS page caching. Um, this was taken from my own site as I was writing a caching presentation and then realized I don't even cache my own site, which is brilliant. Um, so, Boost. Um, Boost is a Drupal project. Um, it's, it's a Drupal module. You add it to your site and enable it in site-built site modules. 
pretty much like any other module. Um, it provides a static cache for all Drupal assets. Um, again, what you'll find with the majority of these caching things, it's only really helpful for anonymous users. Um, for those that deal with authenticated users, caching can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's ideal for shared hosting environments. Um, so not everybody has access to root users on their boxes. Um, as long as you have some shell access, um, boost is ideal um, because that can be easily configured. And out of all the um, caching systems that I'll be covering today, this is potentially the easiest to set up. Vanish. Um, Vanish isn't really a Drupal specific thing, it's, um, it's, it calls itself an application accelerator. So you can stick Vanish in front of a lot of things, Not it doesn't have to be Drupal specific, it just happens that there is a Drupal module for this um, and it's very handy. Um, it's Linux only, um, which shouldn't be an issue for most people. Um, it caches resources based on initial view. So what happens generally is a user requests a page. If the request goes to Varnish, if Varnish doesn't have that data in its cache, it will then pass it back to Apache. Apache then serves the content, which then Varnish caches. Um, again, it's anonymous only, although it is insanely powerful. So you can actually get it to cache and um, authenticate it stuff um, if you play around with VCLs. Um, Vanish is very picky with sessions um, and cookies. You tend to find that the majority of Drupal sites won't work out of the box with Vanish um, because various third party modules do bunch of things with sessions and cookies, in which case you then have to debug which module is causing session writes and stuff like this on page loads. I so it's done briefly. Um, there's the advanced setup for Varnish. Um, it does require an additional module, which shouldn't be an issue. Um, you can have granular time to lives, which is really handy. Um, so if you have a brochure site that only gets content uploaded, say, once every day, then you don't need to worry about expiring cache on that site um, for at least 24 hours. On the flip side of that, you can put it in sites like that are getting content published to it on a minute by minute basis, and you can still cache those. Um, any caching, whether even if it is for a short amount of time, is still good caching. Um, you can get very, very specific in its config um, using the um, VCL. Um, this is just a configuration file um, which lives in Varnish um, install directory. Um, and from there, you can actually specify page elements to cache, um, which is very, very handy. Varnish comes with um, two types of cache store. Um, so a cache store is basically a file with data in. Um, it has two uh, RAM and disk. RAM is super fast, but for larger sites, you will require more memory. Um, I did some benchmarks on my own site um, using a 512 meg instance, and I actually found it was quicker to not have Varnish on there because I was using um, Varnish as a RAM, we're using RAM store, um, and Apache and Varnish were fighting for resources constantly, so it was actually quicker not to have it on. So if you have servers with 8 gig plus RAM, then that's Disk, it's fast. It's not as fast as RAM. Um, and most servers have hundreds of gigs of data these days, so you can cache away. The next type of caching is uh, memcached. Um, this is, again, pretty much like Varnish. It's not specific to Drupal. It just happens that it works quite well with Drupal and there's um, good Drupal integration. Um, it's mostly used for data and database caching. Um, it's kind of a cache for cache, if that makes sense. Um, so, a quick diagram of a typical memcache setup. So, you can use memcache on multiple servers and network them together to create a pool of resources. 
so in this example, we have two servers. Um, they all have 64 meg uh, memory for RIP3. We then use memcache, pull them together. That gives us 120 meg of caching store, which is available to any server that connects into it. Um, a good example of using memcache, by default, when you set it up and enable it, it will cache all core tables. So that's where the idea of caching cache comes from. Um, this means that all the, you can run, um, you can run memcache on HA setups where you have multiple web front ends, multiple DBs, and then multiple memcache servers. Um, because it's shared, um, you can then pull that data from any web server um, without having to worry about it. The API for memcache is dead easy. Um, it's really nice to work with. And because of the API, you're not limited to just what the module gives you. Um, so if you have any custom modules or you have any custom data storage, you can write uh, memcache plugins that can interface with that. Um, again, it requires a Drupal extent. Um, it requires a Drupal module and a Peckle extension. Okay, um, moving on to third-party caching solutions. Um, I'm going to be covering Akamai and Cloudflare, and the two of the biggest um, providers. Although Cloudflare is currently down, which is a big issue. Um, Akamai, it's one of the biggest caching providers in the world. Um, there is a high chance that you've experienced Akamai today, um, just randomly browsing the internet without even realizing it. Um, again, it's a static cache of resources. Um, it then distributes the, this data across um, hundreds of servers all around the world, which means that latency is rarely ever an issue. So if I'm in Japan, I will be hitting a Japan Edge server. If I'm in the US, I'll be hitting whichever is the local US Edge server. So this minimizes latency across the entire network. The one thing with Akamai is because of um, the amount of edge servers they have, is that once the central server gets the data, it then has to push it out. So it does take time for your initial content to be pushed to all these different end nodes. Another thing that Akamai provides is coverage for distributed denial service attacks. Um, they pride themselves on having sort of active monitoring and defense again. This, if you look at the site, um, they actually display how many attacks are happening um, currently, which is a bit um, through They have a really, really amazingly powerful um, control panel, which allows you to do advanced redirect rules. So you can, in theory, have um, a top-level domain, and then you can be pushing off various different um, subfolders or however you want to compete your site to different servers, different infrastructures, all that kind of stuff. The one downside to Akamai is it's not cheap. Um, it's very, very expensive, um, and they don't actually advertise any prices. Um, you have to call them up for a consultation where they'll come back to you with a tailored plan. The good side to it is it's pretty magical. Um, Having worked with it a lot recently, um, I'm very impressed with it. Um, Cloudflare, um, it's very similar to Akamai on a slightly smaller scale. Um, they have an emphasis on security and um, DDoS protection, even more so than Akamai. Although, like I said before, Cloudflare is currently down. Um, so, moving on to content distribution networks. This is a Relatively new thing over the past two or three years. Um, it's C abbreviated to CDNs for short. This allows us to offload um, specific types of resources <coughs> to an external provider, um, such as images, video, audio, large files. Stuff where you don't want to be sharing, say, two, three hundred meg video or audio files off your own server, off your own servers if you're on a server that has a bandwidth quota. Um, Again, this allows you to syndicate content around the world. Um, many providers will do that by default. Um, this limits the latency again and 
if you're in Japan, you'll be in the Japan node and you'll be getting the files through that. So why should you really be using a CDN? Um, content is delivered quickly. Um, you don't have to rely on your own server to publish these files. Um, again, latency is cut down because of this. Um, so you will be getting quicker download in theory. A nice thing about CDNs um, is pricing is granular. It's very much um, a pay-as-you-go type deal. So you only pay for what you use. Um, good examples of the uh, providers are Amazon and Rackspace Cloud. Um, Amazon has S3 buckets and Rackspace Cloud files. Um, I'd highly recommend Rackspace Cloud. So we have all these kind of different caching layers. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to see how these things fit in. So here's a nice diagram. Um, so as you can see on the left, uh, we have Akamai, which is the magical cloud, um, which generally handles majority of requests to web to HA setups and sites that are configured with Akamai. Um, if Akamai can't serve the content you've requested from its internal cache, then what it does is generally it'll pass it off to a load balancer. Um, a load balancer then decides, well, this one varnish server or this other varnish server isn't being hammered as much as the other, so I will pass it off to one of them. If then varnish can't serve that content um, from its own cache, it then passes it off to a web server. Um, and everybody should be familiar with the Apache or Nginx. So from there, what happens is Apache and PHP, Nginx will request data from MySQL or even memcache. Um, the thing I have kind of messed up on my diagram is there should be arrows between the memcache and MySQL instances because you can um, you can run master slave MySQL databases. So what happens when it all goes wrong? Um, the entire world explodes. Um, <laughs> the first thing we generally hear is clients ringing up and saying, what the hell is going on? Uh, it's, it's all down. Um, at which point, try not to panic. Caching, it, because there's so many layers, you should have some coverage. Um, if the third party stuff is amazing because it will shield 99% of anonymous traffic, and even more. And Varnish should, in theory, get the rest. So if your site is configured well, anonymous users should never know there's an issue with your site. Your entire Drupal infrastructure could be down and dead, but as far <coughs> as anonymous users are concerned, they will still be seeing a fresh site so there'll be no service loss for anonymous users. When it comes to debugging um, caching, it can get a bit interesting. Um, so the best thing to do for this would be to configure different URLs. Um, so how we usually do it is we have various URLs per site. So we know that if we hit varnish.blah, then we're seeing a varnish cache. If we hit varnish.blah and log in, because we're authenticated users, we'll be bypassing um, Varnish. Um, Akamai provides its own um, debugging URLs as well. Again, if you do have um, bad data in caches, don't be afraid to flush caches. Um, hopefully, your backend should be able to cope with it. The idea behind this is you have a stable enough server infrastructure that if caching was to fail, then you would still be able to serve pages. It wouldn't be as quick, but you would still have uptime. Um, again, I've got analyzed headers. Um, Curl-I is a huge and very, very important tool for any, anything um, that involves caching. Um, Drupal provides its own um, headers. So if anybody is um, Curl-I uh, Drupal 7 site, it brings back its cache headers straight away. Um, Varnish also provides um, good headers with all the TTLs and whether it's actually coming from Varnish cache. Um, Akamai can provide header information. It doesn't by default. You have to pass it um, some extra parameters in um, HTTP header. Um, but there's, there's, um, there's add-ons for Firefox that will help with that. Another good thing to do is monitor 
Geek Slayer, again. Um, with tools like High Singer, um, which is brilliant. Um, you can send off ping requests every five seconds to all the various different servers, find out if one of your vanished servers has gone down or one of the web servers has gone. Um, this is very, very important when running HJ setups that scale up and down all the time because at any one particular time you can't, you might not necessarily know how many servers are in rotation. Um, so it's always good to have a, a, a good grasp on where the point of failure is. Um, another tool that's quite useful is Pingdom, just for checking the front of your site. Although we tend to find that clients are very good at that. Um, they'll tend to notify you pretty quickly if the site goes down. So um, that's pretty much me done. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yep. Um, I'm unclear uh, how these things relate. So um, there's caching by default, and then if you install Boost, how much better does that make it, and does that stop the other caching? Um, the nice thing about all the caching is you can just keep adding. Um, so by default, all sites should be running the Drupal default <coughs> caching with page caching turned on, CSS and JS compression. Um, what Boost does is it provides just files of the uh, actual site and that it serves without actually hitting um, I think it is the database. But then all your, all your additional caching on top of that will read from Boost. So if you were to add in Varnish like caching, Varnish would then request the page, Drupal site would serve the Boost cache of that, and then Varnish would cache that. So when somebody hits Varnish, they'll get the cache from Varnish without even touching Boost or Drupal or Apache and MySQL. So it's just kind of, it's kind of additional layers mm -hmm. um, to it. And how much faster, to take a simple example, um, how much faster is it with Boost than without? That's a highly, highly dependent um, question. It all depends on server spec, really. Um, you should see some improvement, but it depends. But I mean, if I only see ten percent, am I wasting my time, or is that good? <laughs> I mean, I, I, it depends. Uh, ten percent of a minute is quite a lot of time. Ten percent of a second, maybe not so much. Um, in terms of personal preference, ten percent is brilliant. Any anything where you can get an any speed boost is always better because the web now has to be served fast. Users won't engage with sites that are slow. Um, a, a great example was I think Amazon a few years ago did a case study on page load times and they found that if a page loaded in over 300 milliseconds, the chances are they weren't going to complete orders. So for them, it's key to have a fast site because it directly affects business. And this is the same for well, the majority of people. If a site's slow to load, people aren't going to stick around. Yeah. So if you're um, quite new to caching and you're not very uh, good at server configuration, not too technical, uh, what would be a good place to start? Is that boost? Um, I'd probably avoid boost. Um, I'm not a huge fan <coughs> of it. Um, if you're new to server configuration stuff, I would start off, I'd still start off with um, probably Varnish um, because the documentation surrounding Varnish is actually very, very good. Um, the Varnish module provides a default VCL file, which should be just a simple um, drop in replacement for Varnish's default, um, which works with Drupal out of the box. Um, and kind of from there, you can sort of get a grasp on how Varnish works and sort of improve skills from that, really. Um, if you have root access to your box, then definitely varnish. One additional question. Uh, what is the best varnish only works if you have a lot of memory on your server? Is that um, it depends. If you're using RAM as a storage engine, then you'll need a lot of RAM, but you can configure it to use disk. Um, so, I to start out with, mm -hmm. just use disk. Um, <coughs> if you majority of like cloud service providers, um, they run fast disk storage anyway. Um, so it will still be fast enough for you to, to notice the difference. Are there any new tools for registered users? So <coughs> far it's all anonymous one. Um, Memcached helps with um, <coughs> authenticated users um, because it's, it caches queries. 
Um, so it doesn't really care that much of where the user's coming from or anything. If it's a hard, if it's a heavy hitting query, then it'll be cached. Um, Vanish can handle um, authenticated users. It's just quite complex. Um, so what you tend to do with authenticated users in Vanish is write um, a very specific VCL for your site. So you can say that everything apart from, for example, the Drupal login block is cached. And then when somebody logs in, they get the majority of the content served through Vanish. And then because of the plugin, the login block changes. So this is not cached. Um, it is very difficult to configure stuff like that. It's, but it's worth it in the long run if you do have um, a, a site, a, well, a kind of a speed issue with authenticated login um, and authenticated users. Got any recommendations for benchmarking tools? Um, I said AB Bench for um, anonymous testing, but that will just give you a very good quick metric of saying, yes, your site with vanishes faster. Right. Um, tools like JMeter are brilliant for testing authenticated users. Um, you can write a test to log in X amount of users and ramp it up over time. Um, if you're looking for quick metrics, then AB Bench. Um, but overall, I'd start looking at um, JMeter and stuff. Um, Alex McMahon yesterday um, recommended a tool called BlazeMeter. Um, that I've not looked at yet, but that seems to be pretty good. Um, runs JMeter tests um, in on a cloud environment. Yeah. So. Last question. Yeah. Last question. I have a question. Uh, do you have? Do you think the only way to guys uh, material from adaptive terms, you know, from different clients, it is a, an external tool? Something like Vanish. This, is there any internal tool from Drupal to cast these adaptive terms, adaptive form display? Um, I mean, Boost is a very heavy, is was designed to work with purely for Drupal. Um, I don't know of any other specific Drupal caching methods. Um, I tend to find a lot of a lot of the tools that are used widely now were developed for other applications, and uh, people have just found they work really well with um, Drupal stuff. Um, Drupal's page caching on small sites is generally generally enough. Um, it's only really when you start hitting sites that are getting 30 to 40 requests a second. Um, that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs>